I'm your host, Rob Carbone. This is BD Fools. Barrett, some shake is big. Catch it three. so annoying <laughs> this is so annoying like just do what you're supposed to do all right you don't have to be outstanding right now but just be good be 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 the yankees man i mean i just want this team to get where they're supposed to be for now i'm not asking them to have a top record in the but i am asking them to be one of the better teams in baseball. Screw that. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. This is the Yankees. We're still... It's going to be May 1st. By the time... Oh, no. Okay. So, by the time you're listening to this episode, it's April 30th. As I'm recording, it's technically April 30th. It's past midnight on the 29th, so it's technically April 30th. Um, But it's about to be May 1st. On, on on Sunday, it's go, or I don't know Saturday. It's going to be May first, I believe, and the Yankees are an under five hundred baseball team. I mean, there have been slow starts. We say they get off to a slow start all the time, but never, never have their slow starts of recent years been an entire month. It's been like the first two weeks, right? The first. 10 games, maybe 12, maybe I'll give you 15. But we are t- we are 25 games in now. We're 25 games into the MLB season and the New York Yankees are 11 wins and 14 losses in uh tied for last place in the American League East. And you're sitting here, you're watching all these other teams do really good with their young talent. You know, I was watching the Blue Jays game on MLB Network, um, which, by the way, man, I I had I came to like a, a realization. I don't know if I've said this on the show before, but I was watching the Jays game on on MLB Network or or some of their I think they were showing the highlights, and Vlad Jr. They showed his face in the dugout and in between innings or or in between. You know, when the Jays were in the, um, were at the plate, you know, Vlad Jr. was, was hanging on the fence there. And I, and I, and I came to a friggin' realization, like, how old am I, dude? I was just thinking this, I'm watching Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Like, I, I was, like, I always picked his father in video games when I was playing, like, Fantasy Draft. I always pick Vlad Sr. So I came to a realization. I was like, oh my gosh, am I old? <laughs> I just turned 26 on the 21st. And I feel like I'm 55. Because not is it just that. It's not just that. It's not just that I watched his dad play. But it's me thinking about my dad saying that to me all the time. Because my father, when I was growing up, always used to say that shit to me. And that's what really hits me. My father was always saying how certain players, how, you know, certain players that he was watching, how he watched their dads play. He always told that, oh, I remember watching his father. And now I'm the one who's going to be saying that about Vlad Jr. and, and his dad Sr. Dude, the guy retired in 2011. Like, I feel like that's not even that long ago. When you think about it, that's fucking 10 years ago. I feel so old. That's insane to me. His father, and the scariest part, I don't remember Vlad Sr.'s older days. I remember him in his peak. Like with the Montreal Expos, with the, you know, the early years with the Angels. That's scary shit. That is really scary. I am now at that age where I can say I feel old and I'm not technically old, which scares me. I am watching Vlad Jr. play baseball. 
That's probably, I think that's the first sun. From, it's the first time I've seen, I think it's the first time in my life where I've seen a son and father play. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I just came to a realization. Speaking of fathers and sons, I saw an insane stat that one of my buddy Chris posted on Facebook. A fucking about Nolan Ryan. Just an insane stat. How seven baseball players who struck out to Nolan Ryan also have sons who grew up to strike out against Nolan Ryan too. <laughs> the guy's out here destroying families. <laughs> I just, I saw that stat and I was like, wow. That's pretty impressive when you think about it. So he struck out someone's dad. His son was probably making fun of him. And then the son grows up and he strikes out to Nolan Ryan. Seven times that happened. Seven different father-sons. Uh, father-son duos. Whatever the fucks. I mean, that's funny. That's funny too. But yeah, man. Watching MLB Network and just coming to that realization when I'm looking at Vlad Jr. and realizing, whoa. I saw Vlad Jr. Vlad Senior play at age 29, 30. You know, at the peak of his prime. <laughs> and now I'm going to be watching his son. Am I old? <laughs> That's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. I don't know if I'm nuts here thinking I'm crazy, but uh, someone let me know. Am I crazy for thinking I'm crazy? Or, or am, I, am I crazy for thinking I'm old? I don't know. Goodness gracious. I was also watching the NFL draft tonight. Uh, yeah, or, you know, again, technically yesterday. But the NFL draft. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not the largest football fanatic. You know, I'm not a diehard like I am the Yankees and the Knicks. But, you know, I'm a Giants fan. I watch their games. Uh, we always have family over, you know, relatives over every Sunday to watch the games. And, you know, I'm close with some people from the organization. So, or former... But, you know, so I, I pay attention to them. But fucking, uh, here they are again. It always seems like they try and get cute with the draft and they try to do the unpredictable. And so tonight, after thinking they were going to get pick 11, they end up trading backwards. They trade back for the 20th pick. And they get some kid, I forget his name. It's, it, it's, hmm, I forget the name. Kamaru something, something with a K maybe. And then, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's some wide, I think he's a wide receiver. Like, nobody knows who this kid is. Even my buddy, who's a diehard Giants fan, has no idea who this kid is. Has never seen film of him. Um, But, I mean, it, we, we traded back and we didn't even get an extra pick for this. I mean, I guess we did. It's like 164. But, I mean, pretty much mailing it in again for this season. The upcoming I don't know, man. I know it's like 11. Maybe there wasn't going to be the greatest talent there. But there's there are some guys I would have taken. I I just... It was just the... I think it was after the build-up, right? The build-up after having another losing season. Um, you were waiting for the draft to hope that we could strike somebody. And then to find out we have to... We're trading back and we're just... First of all, you got to stay up an extra hour for that shit. And, you know, by the time it comes, all the great players are off the board just so you can hope that you get a sleeper pick, which, you know, hit or miss. Like, you know, it's going to be a slow process. I don't think the Giants are going to be great this year again. And I think that's what frustrating, that's what the most frustrating part of it is, is that people wanted to stay at 11 because they wanted the Giants to try and get a pick who could help them now. But we'll see. Maybe this kid is something. He's um, going to think he's a wide receiver. I don't even know if he's a wide receiver. I don't. Because that's how little I really cared about the pick. Um, maybe I'm wrong. But. Yeah. <laughs> Joked about it on Twitter too before it happened. You know I said. Uh, said you know. For, for the 20th pick in the draft. Giants select some random white kid out of Nebraska. 
But um, no, some some kid. I, I got to look up his name again. I completely forgot. Phone's charging all the way over there. Don't feel like looking. If I use my tablet, which I'm using to record this podcast, it's probably going to get all laggy and glitchy on me because tablets don't have the best video recording software. So if you try to do too much at once, it'll probably get laggy. So we're going to try to just record this. Um, what else have I heard lately? Anybody else hear that Reggie Jackson has left the Yankees and is now joining the Astros? He's joining the Houston Astros, um, taking on the same role that he initially had with the Yankees. Um, definitely some shade at the Yankees there, I think, you know, for the way things were with them and Reggie. I know they didn't have the greatest relationship. He's joining the Astros. So, take that as you may. Yeah. Um, four game series to the O's. We end up splitting. So, and we have to we have to sit here. Or I don't know about you guys, but I had to sit here and listen to David Cohn. You know, sing songs about Babip. Pitch clock, exit velo, strikeouts, launch angle, <laughs> moving the mound back, and you know basically just throw a parade about about all these new sabermetrics. Sometimes I could tell this guy just goes on air to vent about the shit he saw earlier in the day on Twitter or something, and he uses his airtime to just let out his frustration. You know, he saw something that set off a trigger. He uses his airtime to get it off his chest or something. <laughs> it's annoying, man. Like, I get it. These stats can be useful in some capacity. But some of them, you don't need. It's not like I need to know that the exit velocity of this hit was 118 miles. You know, 118.2 miles an hour. Like, if somebody, like... And so, well, I'm just, like, talking casually to my buddy. I wonder how it is with, like, analytical... Like, with analytics people, with baseball fans who are into analytics, do you guys, and I'm not trying to be a dick, do you guys, I'm genuinely genuinely curious here, do you guys talk to your buddies like that? Like, when you're talking to your friends, like, when I'm talking to my baseball buddies, I don't go, like, when somebody hits the ball hard, I say, oh, he hit that one hard. You know, that's a little bit of bad luck, he hit that hard. Do you guys go, hmm. He hit that hard, but I just want to make sure he hit it hard. So let's look up the exit velo, and it's and if it's over 100, then we could say he hit it hard. Like I don't need to know the number to know that somebody hit it hard and it was bad luck. He just hit it in the wrong spot. <laughs> like that's annoying to me. And then he was Cone Cone was going on about like batting uh, Babbitt batting average on balls in play combined with exit velo, yo. Know, basically as an indicator to say if somebody is just hitting into bad luck versus if they're really struggling. But the problem I have with that is if they're striking out a lot, that doesn't go in. That doesn't factor into BABIP and it doesn't factor in to exit velo. I'm pretty sure it doesn't factor into BABIP. But it's somebody like, you know, cause that was the, that was the excuse for one of Gary Sanchez's several <laughs> poor seasons was that he was hitting into bad luck because his exit velo average was high and his BABIP was pretty... Wow, I am I am hip. I am using these terms so freely right now. And his BABIP was um, also very high. But, you know, in that same season, he struck out. His K rate was through the roof bad. And I don't think that factors... I mean, when you're striking out, that's not bad luck. That's you having poor play discipline. And so that's sometimes, that's my issue with some of these guys who completely rely on these numbers to tell sometimes you just gotta watch the game i know when somebody hits it hard i don't need to know the exact miles per hour of that hit to know that it was some bad luck there you know i don't need to know all that if somebody's having a really bad day at the plate and they're swinging and missing that's i know that or if they're having a bad day at the plate and they just happen to be all line drive outs okay just a, some tough luck but like some of the shit and then Cohn was going on about how the amount of strikeouts in the game aren't due to launch angle. Uh, I mean, creating a hole in your swing by uppercutting is a pretty big deal. That's going to change the contact rate. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that's not factoring in. Now, like he said, pitchers are way more talented today. Sure, that factors in. 
But I'm not going to act like launch angle does not play a big role in why we're getting less in play action. And it goes back to what Gary, uh, Gary Sheffield said a couple you know weeks ago on how he doesn't watch baseball anymore because there's so much less action because it's either strikeout or the ball is going to leave the park and you just watch the player jog around the bases. You're not getting anything in between that, right? You're getting strikeout, home run, or a walk. You're getting strikeout, home run, or a walk. You're not getting the single. You're not getting the double. You're not getting players legging out those triples as much. You're just getting the single walk, home run, single walk, home run. That's what it's become. We've gotten so straight to the point now where it's like there's there's very rare in-between action. And I can understand why somebody like Gary Sheffield said that because he was a guy who had a ton of power. But I don't think the guy in over 22 seasons had a single fucking one of them where he struck out 100 times. I do, I do not. I mean, this guy was a line drive hitter. You know, he knew all about the fundamentals of the game. And that's why I respect players like LeMahieu who don't need the launch angle. Or even Pete Alonso. I'm pretty sure I've heard about him. I don't watch the Mets. I don't care for the Mets. But I'm pretty sure he's also a player who doesn't really launch his bat. I don't know the term for if you're trying to use launch angle in that tense. But Cohen, you know, Cohen, I respect him. He's an awesome dude. He sounds like a really nice guy, but not a fan of him in the booth, man. Not a fan of him in the booth. Um, yeah. One of my questions before we, you know, I, we're going to wrap this up, but like when analytics people tell you strikeouts do not matter. To me, it seems a little hypocritical, kind of contradicting because it's like you go on the other side of things and you guys are always talking about how you love pitchers with, with high K rates. Pitchers that can overpower you and strike you out are so important. That's the kind of pitchers you guys love and you guys always want on your team, you say. But then you go and say how striking out doesn't matter. So it's very... I just, some of it is, is some of, some of it with you guys, it's so contradicting. So I try my best to, you know, adopt and kind of get with it at times, but yeah, I'm not going to sit here and act like there are not major flaws in what you do. And that's why I'm not wholeheartedly just blind by metrics. That's why I try to have a balanced approach to watching the games you know maybe i lean a little more old school than i should but i, I don't think i'll ever 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 want to be strictly watching a baseball game with only numbers and spreadsheets on my friggin' mind but yeah i was always curious how do people who love metrics talk to their buddies about baseball like, it must sound so nerdy and boring. Like, I, I can't imagine the conversation being very fun. If you have to bring up a number every other set, every other word. <laughs> I don't know, man. Mm. All right. Um, but yeah, welcome to the show. Um, this is episode 239 of the podcast. B4 where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. I am your host, RJ Carbone. So welcome to the show. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can subscribe to BD4 on Apple Podcasts, where you can also give us a five-star rating if you love the show. Um, we're on Spotify. We are on YouTube. If you want to watch the podcast on YouTube, the video version is up on there. And many more major podcast feeds. You know, you can also follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you want, you can follow the blog that I write um, after every single Yankees and Knicks game. Um, so all that stuff, the blog, social media, and the podcast, which again, I record these podcasts. Um, the, the Knicks are after every two games and the Yankees after every series. If you want to find all that information I just mentioned, be sure to find that on my link tree. You know, so if you go to my link tree, you'll find the many different links to what I just said. So go to my link tree at linktr.ee forward slash RJ Carbone, 
and that will take you right there. It is a Thursday night. Technically, again, a Friday morning, early morning. As I am recording, it is past midnight. Just got finished watching the NFL draft. The Giants took some dude, I don't know. Um, Trevor Lawrence ends up going to the Jags. The Jets got their guy at number two from BYU. Uh, the Mormon Mahomes, they call him. Number three pick, um, shit, forget who it was. But Justin Fields didn't get picked until, you know, middle of the first round. And I forget who he went to. Did he go to, uh, hmm, San, no, not San Fran. Oh, man, I forgot, but I was kind of shocked, but not really at the same time because I guess the bias Ohio State fan of me wanted him to go earlier, but at the same time, I get it because you look at all these Ohio State quarterbacks and not a lot of them really pan out, right? I remember Troy Smith being one of the, who I loved in college. Wasn't exactly great in the NFL. Um, maybe more recently for, for those who aren't that old, like I said I am, um, what's that guy, that kid, uh, Cardell, is it Cardell Jones, or Cardell Smith, I think it's Cardell Jones, who, uh, he hasn't exactly panned out, is it the same guy from the Redskins, who's, ha who's Haskins, I don't know, I'm getting all fucked up, um, yeah, so that happened, <laughs> Uh, I want to get to the show, though. I want to get right into the show. I don't want to waste any further time because it is, you know, I need to get some sleep and I need to put this up, edit it, and um, so that's that. So thanks for coming by. Thanks for joining the show. And uh, again, this is episode 239 of the podcast, BD4. Welcome to BD4. I am your host, RJ Carbone. And for this episode, again, we're talking Yanks. Yanks, still not there yet. We are still not there. Um, It's... It's been a rough season. Um, it's been a rough April. I'm ready to put it behind us and start this new Detroit series. Um, hopefully we can find something here. But let's let's head to our first break. When we get back from break, we will start to dive into this four-game series and give our opinions on some certain things, and we'll go from there. All right. Be right back. All right, so, sorry, just setting this thing up here. Hopefully this this cooperates with us because it's not been cooperating for a long time. Um, I, I don't know if it's my, I can't imagine it's my tablet. Maybe it is. I don't know if it's the software, but again, I don't think tablets are that good for video recording shit. And it's lagging on me as I fucking speak, which is really starting to piss me off. I'm really getting turned off by this. Might have to buy a laptop. I don't know. But this is not going to cut it. This is definitely not going to cut it. Because I'm recording this shit is slow. It's choppy. But hopefully we can get through it. Uh, we'll see. So, okay. Um. Yeah, the Yankees lose uh, game one and four. Of this series. Jesus. Alright. So they lose game one. Uh, by a score of 4-2. to two Against the Orioles. They fucking. You have Davey Garcia. Versus the Dark Knight. Matt Harvey in 2021. By the way. <laughs> you know game starts off. Um, lead off home run by Cedric Mullins. Um off Garcia in the first inning, one nothing. The O's take the lead. Then you have Freddie Galvez in the second inning with the RBI double, two nothing O's. Garcia off to a shaky start. Um, sixth inning, 
Yankees finally get to Harvey. You have Stanton and Judge going back to back with a couple of doubles. That cuts the lead in half two to one, or the deficit for the Yankees. Bottom of the six, though, Darren O'Day in the game. Excuse me. Um, he balks in a run. <laughs> a very subtle balk, but a balk. And that becomes three to one Orioles. Later in the seventh, you get Cedric Mullins once again going yard, this time off Justin Wilson. It makes four to one O's. Uh, top of the eighth, Gio Urshela singles to left. That scores Clint Frazier, but then you've got Aaron Judge trying to go from first to third on a ball to left field that didn't even reach the wall. He gets called out before DJ crosses the plate. DJ was coming home from second on the play. Um, it looked like DJ crossed the plate first, so Boone went to challenge it, but the appeal was too late, and he was denied the challenge. He was, you know, understandably very upset. He was a rate. He gets tossed from the game. Loved the energy. May have been you know, three weeks too late, pal, but I did love that he went out there and, and kind of tried to fire his team up. My issue with that whole thing why are you hesitating to challenge that to begin with? I mean, you're in the eighth inning of a tight ball game. You're last place in the standings. You are trying, clearly trying to get something together here. Why are you even hesitating? What's the wait? And this is what I always talk about. This is why I always say how the Yankees have lost their feel for the game. Stop waiting for your analytics lords upstairs to tell you what to do and go with your gut for a change. You know, don't look at Mendoza. Don't wait for the guys in New York to tell you whether you should throw the red flag, quote unquote, or not. But go with your gut. I mean, shit, why are we seriously, seriously, what is the hurt? And right away, challenge in that play. And if you're wrong, you're wrong because it's the eighth inning. The game's almost over. You're about to lose. You need in any ways you can. You need as many wins as you can get. That is a play you challenge. Whether that being overturned or not is besides the point. May have been too close to to be conclusive. But man, that frustrated the hell out of me. You don't wait. Even if the challenge didn't get come in too late, you got to do it right away. There should not be thinking. You got to go with your gut. This is baseball. You you can't be doing what you were doing there. If you're Aaron Boone, that shit has to be done right away. And then after the game, Boone goes in and, and you know, talks to the media and and says how he, he feels he was, and I swear to God, he said he feels he was bullied by the crew chief umpire, whoever it was. Was it Rob Drake? He felt he was bullied by, by the crew chief. That guy, the guy who was um, telling you that these guys were a bunch of savages a couple of years ago, now thinks he's getting bullied. That's that's who's that's who's leading your your evil empire, guys. That's the guy, a bully victim. Everybody loves playing the victim card nowadays. We know that, and we can get into a whole other conversation for that. That it wouldn't even it would go beyond baseball. I'll tell you that right now, but we won't go there. We will not go there. But man, was that infuriating? The whole thing, the whole situation, did not love how it played out. Anyways, that's not why they lost. That is not why they lost. They lost this game because the Yankees were bitched around. By the Dark Knight in 2021. Matt Harvey turned back the clock, found the Fountain of Youth for a night, and he goes six strong, one run, three measly hits. He walks Glaber Torres in that second inning, then he goes on a tear and retires 11 straight Yankees. Um, that ends when he walked Frazier in the sixth, but then he got DJ to roll over a fastball for a GIDP. That took us to the Stanton Judge double sequence. But yeah, a piss poor offensive effort in this one. Overall, the Yankees just managed two runs, four hits, seven walks, but you know, just poor at bats. Um, top of the eighth, they had a chance. 
loaded the bags with one out against Tanner Scott. Um, Root Nettle Door, why is he our cleanup hitter there? I don't know, but he is, and he struck out helplessly. You know, then Hyde goes for Valdez to get the righty on righty matchup versus Geo, and that's when you got the judge play going from first to third. On the flip side, you know, Davey Garcia to start, he was a mixed bag, you know, in his first outing of the year, his first outing with fans in the stands. Um, four innings pitched, two runs, three hits, uh, and this was at Camden, obviously. Three walks, four strikeouts, 65 pitches. You know, he had to work to get his outs. Nothing came easy for him in this one. Again, a slow start with a couple of runs in the first two innings, and he found some rhythm. Uh, but, you know, <clears throat> later pulled so he didn't have to face Mullins again for a third time in that fifth inning. So, uh, the fastball had Velo. You know, he was throwing 93. I think he hit as high as 96 at one point. Um, but it was probably his worst pitch of the night, for sure. The four-seamer was, was, you know, he left it in some bad spots and, you know, gave up some damaging hits with it. And, you know, damaging hits are bad, guys. So... <laughs> That was game one of the series. Um, let's get to game two, where the Yankees took a 5-1 to one low, uh, No, they, they, they won. Yeah. They took a 5-1 to one victory. You had Corey Kluber going up against Zimmerman. Not Jordan Zimmerman. What happened to that guy? That was a third baseman, too, wasn't it? Or is that Ryan Zimmerman? And there was another Jordan... Wasn't there a Jordan Zimmerman pitcher for the Nationals? And there was a Ryan Zimmerman third baseman? Or am, I, or am I out of my mind? Sorry. I don't know. Anyway, top of the first inning. DJ LeMahieu doubling, you know, to lead off the game. Jumping on second pitch. Then you get Judge picking up a single. And, you know, later you have Gio Urshela getting the first sack fly of the season. April 26th. The first sack fly for the Yankees all year long. Is that embarrassing or what? Is that not embarrassing? I mean, this thing, this team can't do the little things. So I guess it's not shocking. But it's always going to be embarrassing. First sack fly of the year. Now, a couple years ago, we had so many sack flies where we led the league. Where, you know, sack flies are good. I love them. But you need to have a balance, right? You, you can't just do them. You have to have some damage damaging hits and you have to know how to do some damage but like you gotta be somewhere in the middle and the Yankees this year that was their first one uh, Judge hits the home run though in the third inning makes it 2 nothing Yanks uh, in the fourth inning we knocks Zimmerman out of the game first it's Higgy going yard but then DJ Stanton and Judge all juice up the bags to bring in former Yankee prospect Dylan Tate Urshela singles off Tate and you have yourselves a 4 nothing Yankee lead. Tacked down on the 7th when Giancarlo, he goes deep to make it 5-1. to one. Um, And that was that. The bats look lively. Good breakout performance there. You had 12 hits, 3 walks, just 7 strikeouts, 5 extra base hits, and 5 different multi-hit outings. Um, yeah. Top of the order, six for thirteen. Couple guys in the bottom of the order, middle to bottom, had a couple of two hit performances. It was good. It was good. Um, Kluber, Corey Kluber looked good. Six and two thirds innings, one earned run, five strikeouts, ninety five pitches. He was sharp. And again, just that one run off the infield single there, but that was it. I enjoyed this performance. You know, it wasn't impressive. You know, the Orioles have one of the worst lineups in baseball. But it was necessary for sure, right? It was needed for Kluber's momentum, for the Yankees' momentum as well. You know, it was a stepping stone start. You needed that to happen. And if you want more positives, the Yankees were saying on the broadcast, they've said it a couple times this year, how Kluber is notorious for getting off to very slow starts in the month of April. So, something to think about. 
Do I think he's going to pan out to be the ace he once was? No, but is there hope there that he could hope, you know, be a 3.30 ERA guy? I'll even take that. Do I see that? I have to see a lot more to, to hop on that Kluber train. But it was a stepping stone, right? You put together a couple more good outings in a row, and maybe I'll start thinking like that. I like the uh, the curveball changeup sequence was looking pretty good. Uh, the fastball, you know, had some velocity to it. There was a, there was a tick up. There was a, an uptick in velocity from his previous three or four uh, outings. So I liked I liked what I saw. He had great rhythm. The confidence was oozing. He was, he was working very fast. He was Klubot. You know, they always talk about how he's Klubot. Kind of like LeMahieu being a robot and no emotion, just, just doing his job over and over. No extra shit. That's what he was doing. Johnny Lasagna, Lucas Litke came in to relieve the kid, uh, the veteran. And they did a good job. Johnny came in during the seventh and escaped, um, you know, a two men on jam um, through the two seamer well mixed in that filthy change up some more kept hitters off balance love how he's finally finding a niche here with the Yankees you know kind of finding a an identity as this high lev guy so that's good it's good to see him have an elite season so far and I, I'm rooting for him you look at his career numbers each and every year he's improving statistically uh, last year he was solid I think that was the first time where he actually looked, you know, semi-consistent. But this year, I mean, he's he's been dominant. And you love you love a young arm from the system. You love that. You just wish we could have more starters like that. Hopefully Davey, hopefully Herman, I don't know. And then Licky came in to pitch a clean ninth um, to save Chapman. You know, some rest there for Chapman. Game three. This was the first game of the... Maybe. Because it is the O's. But it felt really good. You felt like the Yankee offense maybe found something. 7-0 victory. You know, you Domingo versus Dean Kramer. Poor Kramer, man. This guy only pitches against the Yankees. Literally. I... I <laughs> only against the Yankees. I, I bet they get on him for that in the clubhouse. You got, do you think like they get on him and they just like fuck with him? Like, oh, you're playing your team today. <laughs> but see, he's only pitched against the Yankees. Maybe two other teams, but like, was he eight career starts? Five of them against New York Hornets? I don't know. It feels like that. I got to double check. Don't fact check me there, but shit. Um. Yeah, Yanks don't score in the first. They get the DJ single. Later on, Torres picks up a double with the bases empty. Um, but they don't score. They score in the second. Uh -huh. Excuse me. They score in the second when Ford goes oppo for a home run. He goes the other way. Makes it one nothing. Then you get Torres with the RBI single to bring in DJ in inning number three. <clears throat> Um, and then Geo, the next at bat, plates in three with a three run bomb. That makes it five zip Yanks. Hicks, sack fly in the fifth. Once Kramer leaves the game, gets the sack off of Armstrong. Hicks does. Um, Clint with the tack on home run in the eighth, his first of the year, his second RBI of the season. Much needed. Um, and on the other end, again, Domingo was stellar. He was brilliant in total command. He had the no hit going for what? Four and two thirds until the infield single by Ryan Mountcastle. Such a weird name. Uh, but he was good. He kept it low. He was elevating eye levels with the fastball too. Orioles hitting everything to the pull side. Um, and, you know, I think Domingo's out pitch was that changeup, though. Most of the outs came off that changeup. So it looked good. Seven innings, three hits, zero runs, six strikeouts, only needed an efficient 92 pitches. So it looks like he's riding the ship here. 
two straight quality starts after two rough starts. Hopefully he can get back to the guy he was in 2018 when he won 19 or 18 ball games out of 22 decisions. So rooting for him as a player, you know, it's, it's tough to root for somebody who has a history like he does as a human being, but you know, I'm not going to not root for a player on my team. Michael King was great again. Two innings pitched at the end there. Um, strikes out a batter in each inning. And then he gets to 5-4-3 to cap the night. Lineup was fantastic again. 12 hits again. 5 extra hit base hits again. Uh, I think it was the same exact line. You got 12, 5, 7 strikeouts, 7 runs this time. Uh, but 5 multi-hit efforts again. So... Yeah, the Clint embarrassing base running blunder. Now, like, I mean, do these guys not know how to do anything but hit home runs? I mean, seriously, how hard is it for these guys to learn to run the bases? I mean, it's incredible. How many base running outs are we going to run into this year? How many base running outs are we going to run into? We definitely, most definitely lead the league in that shit. And it's really, really difficult to sit through and watch. And the most frustrating part about it is not only do we lead the league in this in that shit, these are really simple advanced one base bullshit blunders that we're making right now. I mean it's it's not even crazy. Like we're doing things that we should not even be doing. And we're making things look so difficult. It shouldn't be hard to advance from first to second. It shouldn't be hard to know not to go to first and third on a ball that doesn't even reach the wall. This shit should be in your brain since second grade you learned this, man. Base running is a fundamental of baseball. It is so hard to sit through this. It's a chore. Every game we make one of these things. We have no IQ. But we won the game. Didn't win game four. We lose game four, four to three. A four to three loss. Um, Jordan Montgomery going up against Jorge Lopez. First inning, Trey Mancini gets the RBI single. One nothing O's. Um, Then Monty kind of settles in. Um, Yanks score a run for him at the top of the fifth. You have Odor. The big two-run single. Game's tied in the sixth when Mancini, you know, he hurts Montgomery again with the home run this time. Two to two. Eighth inning comes. Both pitchers out of the game by then, obviously. Gio walks off of Paul Fry. And then Judge pinch hitting for Odor just so they just so the Yankees can get the righty on lefty matchup advantage. Dude, Odor is at the time he was one at bat removed from that fucking tie breaking single. This is a guy with ten RBIs on the year who hasn't even been here all year. And yet you, you remove him for the game to have Judge pinch hit just so you can get the righty on lefty advantage. And I get it. But that right here, that right there, is what I'm always talking about. Whenever I say I hate how the Yankees have lost complete feel for the game, you know, the over-reliance on the numbers, the spreadsheets, and the love for this hand in this bullshit, you know, that's where it goes back to hot versus the numbers game. Playing the percentages. That's what I can't stand. Right there. I would just go with what's working. Odor's been hot. Or he's gotten clutch hits for you all year. He just had a nice hit for you a couple innings ago. And you fucking pull him for Aaron Judge just to go 0 for 10 as a pinch hitter. And we're going to get into why Judge hasn't played in just one second. But that was a little questionable for me. I didn't love that move. I definitely didn't love that move. But it happened. Certainly did. Certainly did. Um, 
Bottom of the eighth comes Austin Hayes, the doubles to center field. That scores a run off all day, three to two. O's. Top of the ninth, Torres. Two outs, down to two strikes. Big double for the Yankees. Hopefully that can get him going. Big double. Ties the game at 3-3 three three, though. Only 3-3 three three because the double bounced over the wall for a ground rule. Which sucks, man. I hate that shit. It's frustrating. But it's a rule. Which, you know, I think Cone was complaining about that one too. <laughs> um... You know, in the bottom of the ninth comes, um, at least Chapman shuts it down, as he always does now. I mean, he's monstrous this year. The 1 2 3 with filthy stuff strikes out all three batters, ho hum. A couple of swinging Ks, and one backwards K, I believe. Then you get to the 10th. <laughs> oh, man. Tyler Wade failing to bunt. Gets himself out, bunting with two strikes. Fouling. If you can't hit, if you're a career 190 hitter, you best be the best fucking bunter in baseball. This guy gets three opportunities and he still can't cash through. Like I said, do these guys even know what the word fundamentals is? They don't do the little things. They don't know that you can do little things in baseball. They just think it's home run or bust. And just lazy attempts by Wade too. It's almost like the Yankees told him to go up there no matter what the count was and just bunt because you suck. <laughs> it seriously felt like that. And he just did it in spite. Bottom of the 10th. The O's win by the sack bunt and then getting a the sack fly off lasagna. What do they call that? Poetic fucking justice? There it was. They, they execute by playing small ball. Look at that. It worked. <laughs> Probably should have intentionally walked Mullins there who ended up getting the, the game winning sack fly. Probably should have intentionally walked him. This guy has been killing us all year. He's been on fire. One of the American League's better hitters right now. But hey. But hey. Montgomery was at least you know, okay. Five innings pitched. Two runs. Only one strikeout, which... Sucked because I had him getting the over on five and a half, which once again destroyed my parlay. Um, you know, most of his starts this season have been decent to whatever, you know, mixes up his pitches, gets soft contact, the usual t for him, but nothing extraordinary. But I'll give him some slack because, you know. Boone keeps yanking this guy in the worst spots. He keeps letting him go out there to start these innings. And then as soon as he gets into trouble, as soon as something bad happens, he'll pull him. Like he three starts ago, his quality start was ruined because of that. Two starts ago, it was Torres not making that play. Then he yanks him. And then today, it's the home run. And he yanks him after having 72 pitches in five innings. Five plus innings. Which I forgot to put 5 plus there. I'm very OCD, so that's a big thing to me. Um, but it sucked. And you could see he was visibly pissed off. He's been really pissed off lately at Boone. You could see it. Walking back to the dugout, in the dugout, in the presser. Today it really ticked him off in the presser. He was speaking slow and loud. You could kind of tell, like the way he was talking, it was very passive aggressive towards Aaron Boone. You know, I only had 72 pitches in the fifth inning. Yeah, to Meredith. It was pretty, it was pretty easy. And I loved it. I love how he was showing his anger towards Aaron Boone, who 
should have let the guy it, it's it's one or the other right don't send him back out or send him back out and let him work through it but Montgomery kept him in the game um, that's that's become the thing we say with every pitcher not named Garrett Cole but fortunately this series was a little bit better we got some length from Herman. we got some length from Kluber just couldn't get much from Davey and um, the unfortunate situation there with Mon Montgomery being pulled after 70 pitches <clears throat> Lineup was ugly. Three runs on eight hits, ten strikeouts, and three for 14 in scoring position. That's like a 214 BA. 12 left on base. Uh, Torres, another throwing error. So if you want to look at the defense, not exactly sharp there. The positives of this series, um, yeah, DJ LeMayu looks better. You know, the line drives are back, going the other way some more. 333 average, 474 OBP, five hits, four walks, just one K. Wasn't expanding the zone like he has been. Um, wasn't trying to pull. And he let it come to him. And he slapped base hits the other way in the gap. And, you know, made hard contact. He is the catalyst, DJ. When he is right, so are the Yanks. So it's good to see him. Hopefully, hopefully he's back on track now. Hopefully he used that Oriole pitching as a launching pad. Giancarlo is extremely hot right now. He's 9 for 18 in his last four games. He went 9 for 18 in the series. Um, in his last seven games, he's hitting 450. He only had one RBI in the series, but, you know, we're not putting anybody on base. And plus, he's hitting second in the order, which... Can we get him back to the fourth spot? I'm pretty sure he hit second again tonight. I may be wrong earlier today. But I would just like to keep him at four no matter what. Don't mess with his spot. But he's hot right now. Um, Geo continues to look very solid. He's looked solid. You know, he's the one Yankee. <clears throat> losing my voice here. He's the one Yankee who has shown up every day from game one to right now. He's the one guy who hasn't been that bad. You know, he's been good. He's been good. I I'm very, the home runs are there. He's hitting at a high clip. He's playing defense, of course. And he's staying healthy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Torres showed some life, you know. Good to see that. Maybe it gets him going. But, man, where's the, where's the power, dude? The dude still doesn't have one home run. That's scaring me. Because, like, even if he gets hot, how many is he going to end with? In the, is he going to be able to hit 30? 25? 20? Got to see this guy get hot, man. He's a big part to this lineup. I was so high on him. And then he started regressing. He started regressing last year. And it's carried over. He's going down the Gary Sanchez path. He needs to start going again. I was hoping this guy would be one of the faces of the game. Right along with Acuna Jr. Right along with Vlad. Right along with Tatis. I thought he would be right there. Oh my gosh. It's so sad and disappointing. But he showed some life. So that's a positive from this series. Michael King has been quietly fan-fucking-tastic for this Yankees team. As have the bullpen, which, you know, I haven't really given enough credit. They've been much better than I said. I have been giving them a lot of criticism heading into the year I was. But they've been good, and Michael King has been a big part of that. 11 innings pitched. Um, yeah, 11 innings and no earned runs. Got the zero ERA still. Knock on wood. But he keeps getting sent down, which is annoying, because he has literally been perfect. But and I don't think I think once you get sent down, you can't get called up until ten days later. So that sucks. You know the Yanks have been doing this musical chair shit, and they're probably going to continue to do it. So King's probably, you know. He still has options, so he's probably going to be up and down all year. They're doing this thing with a fifth starter, so. But he's been good. Uh, Clint showing some more aggressiveness of late, changing the approach, uh, changing his changing his approach. In the second half of this series, he's starting to swing more, not taking every single pitch in the strike zone now, which is good. He had the home run, and I think he had another extra base hit, so. 
negatives. Um, can we start winning more, please? I don't know. Dude, Aaron Hicks sucks. Was he 0 for 15 this series? And the man, his arm is, is completely shot. Post Tommy John, it does not look great. I mean, that throwaway today? Whew. Down the line? I mean, wild, way off line. Just wild. You go back and look at some of the tape. Look at his arm pre-Tommy John versus post-Tommy John. And the difference is... Jaw-dropping. And if he's not hitting... I don't know. Doesn't matter where he is in the lineup. He's not hitting. Gardner's not hitting. Not playing a ton, but he's not hitting. Guy's washed. I mean, listen, I appreciate what he's done for the Yankees, but he's basically here just to play defense and work the pitch count. Basically just here for nostalgic reasons. Which, you know, we disguise with using veteran leadership as the label. You know, Aaron Judge sat out the last couple of games of the series. Because he's sore from traveling and running the bases. And I shit you not, you can look at Brian Hoke's tweet. Traveling and running the bases. Put those two things in quotes. He said that. That's what Boone said. I was listening to a clip on YouTube. It was John Boy. And he said it perfectly. He was reading a couple of quotes about Jeter. Saying how you are either hurt or are you, or you are either healthy. If you're not hurt, you're healthy. And if you're not healthy, you're hurt. And how there should be no more of this, oh, he's 62.5% today. You know, we're going to take it easy on him because he's only 62.5%. You know, he's not 100% healthy, so he's going to take a day off. Aaron Boone's, I mean, uh, Aaron Judge's ass cheeks from the seat cushions on that plane, they're still hurt. The bed in the hotel room, that wasn't soft enough for him. He's hurt from travel. He's been running the bases a lot lately. You know, things baseball players are supposed to do. So we're going to give him some time off his feet. Lower body stuff. Be healthy or don't be healthy. None of this half and half shit. Are you ready? Are you not ready? I mean, but the, the shit we have to sit through and accept as, as Yankees fans, the scheduled off days in April, which is a month where off days are already built into. The you know, whole X amount of games in a row rule that we've got for not only pitchers now, but for certain players like Stanton. I, I don't get it. Sleep schedule, sleep doctors. This is insanity, dude. It's insane. There are no amount of metrics that can fucking put this to test. Like, I... I Oh, it's insane. Play the friggin'. If you're healthy, play the game. If you're not healthy, okay, don't play the game. So be it. But to tell me he's going to sit out because he's sore from traveling a couple of hours on a flight and he's been running the bases a little bit lately? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I mean, Glaber Torres sits out early in the year because he jammed his finger. He didn't sprain or break his finger. He jammed his finger. Aaron Hicks sits out. He's sitting out again because he's protesting because he, he needs a mental day. Are you kidding me with this shit? Some of this shit makes you think it's a troll job. But then you look it up, you read about it, and it's real. You watch these games, and they're not out on the field because it's real. Because they're actually sitting out for these ridiculous, insane freaking reasons so I shit you not Aaron Judge 
sore from travel and running the bases. Are you kidding me? Derek Jeter would never. You guys want to compare him to Derek Jeter and his fucking persona. What, because he sits in the post game and says positive comments? Is that it? We're supposed to pay this guy next year, really? On the wrong side of 30. He's suddenly become he's suddenly gonna become Iron Man. When is he when he's ugh, fucking can't talk? Aaron Judge is suddenly gonna turn into Iron Man when he's on the other side of 30 years old. And you guys want to pay him. I mean, a lot can happen between now and the end of next season. So I don't want to jump ahead here. But if this continues to be a trend, yeah, I'm not paying the guy. Sorry. No. Gary also didn't play for, for a couple of games during this series, but he wasn't hurt. He was just benched. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, he was just benched because he, well, he sucks. Boone came out and said it in the post game to one of these, it was a game two or three, that he's going to be giving Kyle Higashioka a lot more time going forward. And Gary, he better not bitch about not seeing this one coming like he did in the offseason, talking about the postseason, because this shit has been going on for... We're going on four years now where he's been underachieving. Cashman gave this guy, you know, a non tender and given a six six million dollar raise. Was he expecting different? We've been saying this forever. This guy is who he is right now. This is it. This is what you're getting. This is Gary Sanchez. Ton of power. Nothing else. Reading a comment on the internet the other day. Gary's being scapegoated. Are you kidding me? Guy, this is going on for four years. That's not scapegoating. This guy has sucked. Sucked for four years. So that's one. We have a backup catcher who's the only player on this team right now hitting over 300. That's two. And the other guys at least have track records saying they'll turn this shit around. You know, Aaron Judge, we know. When he's healthy, he's good. Glaber Torres, we've seen. But again, he is heading towards... You know, maybe that's not the greatest example, but... None of these guys, even Glaber's struggles, have lasted as long as Gary Sanchez's struggles have lasted. He's been struggling going on four seasons in a friggin' row. Dude, Really? You know DJ is going to turn it around. You hope. You hope he doesn't end up having one of those years like where he did. You know in, in Colorado where he hit 348 and the OPS was over 900. Then the next year he had like a 270, 700 something OPS. Hopefully this isn't one of those years. But I have faith he'll turn it around. You know, Judge, if he can stay healthy, will be productive for them. Giancarlo, if he can stay healthy, will be, will be productive for them. Geo has been productive. You know, guys have either got track records to say that they'll turn it around. But Gary doesn't have that track record. And he has 2015 and then 2016. Right? He has the 50 games in his rookie season in 2015. And then he's got the solid sophomore year in 2016. That's it. Ever since then, that's been it. There's no scapegoating going on here. There's a guy who's been really bad performing really bad. So that happened. And I like what Higgy's doing, man. He calls a good game. Pitchers like pitching to him. And he can hit a little bit. Yankees have always liked his pop. He's got some opposite field power. Seen him pull a few. He'll take it. And don't expect him to continue being a 300-1000 guy. You know? He's going to be a backup catcher at the end of the day. The numbers are going to look like that. Backup catcher production. But if he plays clean, efficient baseball, you want him. Mike Talkman was traded for 
29 year old Wandy Peralta. Damn, man, I like Talkman. But he goes to San Fran. And hopefully you can help them. He's a, you know, a good fundamental player, a good backup outfielder. Gives you defense, speed, some good plate discipline. Had some lefty pop a couple years ago. Then he you know, got hurt last year and his, he had a horrendous season at the plate. But, you know, I think the logic behind this trade is Talkman doesn't play much. He had no more options left. You know, he's out of options. Uh, he Plus, our bullpen is, is already completely taxed here in April. So we were looking for extra help there with Britain still on the DL. Um, Peralta's a guy who our analytics staff probably likes a lot. I'm guessing that's why they got him. Left-hander, high spin rate, throws 96, got a good breaking ball. Um, maybe, you know, so maybe some untapped potential here. The Cashman special, right? Getting a guy who you think you can untap some, unlock some with. Maybe work with Matt Blake. Matt Blake's got, Matt Blake has been pretty good this year, at least. He's getting guys to throw more changeups, and he's, he's unlocking some guys who haven't exactly been unlocked in recent years. <clears throat> so he's getting something out of Sessa these last couple of years. Lasagna, we're seeing you know Jordan Montgomery and Cole throw that change up more often. So we'll see. We'll see what this Peralta guys does. Talkman was fun. He was a cool dude. Um, and you know I, I know that Kepler was excited to get him. Read some quotes on that. Calling him a potential long-term piece. So. Best of luck to him and Estrada, who's over there. Tyro, Tyro Estrada's over there with him. So, disappointed, but see what this Peralta guy has. You know, we'll, we'll see what we'll see what's up here. And um, yeah, all in all, better for sure these last couple of series, but. Nowhere am I, I'm not even close to, you know, I'm not losing confidence by the day like I was the first, you know, so-and-so series of the year up to that Cleveland series. I'm not losing confidence by the day like I was, but I'm also, I'm still not at that point where I'm going much upwards either. I'm not really going, I'm like, like maybe a little more than middle, like slightly up, but I'm not even marginal, marginal improvement in my opinion we've got to see a lot more you know i'm not going up as much as i would prefer you know i, I need to see some more indicators here it's good that some of the bats are starting to click and we're getting some length but we're just not winning games still consistently yet three games in a row that happened once and that, that was as far as it went so ebbs and flows of the game i guess um I tell you one thing, uh, we gotta sweep the Tigers. If we can't even we can't even win the series against the O's, we better sweep the Detroit Tigers. It's at Yankee Stadium. You've got your best pitchers thrown and Garrett Cole. And uh, I think yeah, you got tie on after that. But you know, you got Garrett Cole and it's the Detroit Tigers. You've gotta figure them out. Sweep. It's a three game set, so it's sweepable. It's at home. The Tigers are nowhere near contenders this season sweep you know by the way we haven't seen them since 2019 because you know the covid schedule last year and obviously they weren't in the playoffs so we haven't seen them in a bit so we'll we'll be seeing them um that's it guys that's it let's get to break one more time when we get back from break we'll get to the nyy nyk question of the day <clears throat> All right, so um, let's get to where I need to be. So, in episode 238, last time out, question I asked you guys, 
which Yankee held the record for the most consecutive seasons with 100 RBIs? Okay, which Yankee held the record for most consecutive seasons over 100 RBIs? And the answer to that question, Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig is the answer to that one. Tonight's episode 239, which Yankees player is the only player to hit a Grand Slam in Game 7 of the World Series? Which Yankees player is the only player to hit a Grand Slam in Game 7 of the World Series? Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. My tablet's acting like a fucking loser again. It's just being fucking useless. I'm getting pissed off, so I'm going to end this shit. And I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Thanks so much. And I fucking hope to see you fucking next time. Unless I throw this tablet out the window and slam it with a sledgehammer. I plan to see you next time in 240 when we talk Knicks, which should be tonight as you're listening. We are going to record Knicks. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. Ciao. This podcast is sponsored by Anchor.